All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Innocent Adwiko. Uh, I will be your moderator today. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, email address, internationalization, configuration, and uh, universal acceptance readiness of uh, programming languages using Java. Uh, this is uh, the last of our webinar acceptance webinar uh, uh, universal acceptance webinar series hosted by uh, Access Plus we, uh, with our partners that include uh, ICANN, Mozilla, the Internet Society of Uganda chapter, uh, the Ministry of ICT in Uganda, and uh, NITAU, that is the National Information Technology uh, Authority here in Uganda. Uh, these webinars have come a long way, uh, if I'm to take you back, uh, since June, when, uh, uh, when we had our first webinar on why it is important to have multiple languages on the internet. This was followed well by uh, our July webinar on uh, why universal acceptance matters, in other words, why we should care. Uh, so our webinar last month uh, showcased universal acceptance uh, acceptance initiatives around Africa and globally. Uh, well, how the initiatives are being implemented, and we were glad to hear success stories of projects in, uh, for example, Benin and Egypt. Uh, today we will be going a bit technical, and we are honored to have facilitators from ICANN. Who, uh, who will introduce themselves soon. Uh, so I'd love to assure you that uh, you'll be having a productive one and a half hours of your time this morning, afternoon or evening. Uh, just before we get started, uh, some housekeeping rules. Uh, please keep your mic on mute unless you are speaking. Uh, feel free to raise your hand in case you have a question, preferably after the presentation. You can all alternatively use the chat to ask your questions or uh, share your comments. Uh, so uh, be kind, inclusive, and respectful, of course. Uh, so, But most of all, enjoy, engage, and learn. So uh, please feel, also feel free to introduce yourself on the chat so that we can know who is in the session. Uh, maybe you can uh, include your name, your maybe your organization, and where you're joining from. Uh, so uh, without further say, I will hand over to our facilitators who will uh, introduce themselves, and then take us through the session today. Thank you all. Let's enjoy the session. Over to you, Samad and uh, Chantka. Thank you, uh, Innocent, and thank you, uh, Access Plus, for giving us the opportunity to speak and for uh, organizing this uh, uh, session. Um, my name is uh, Sarmad Hussain, uh, and I am with the IDN uh, Internationalized Domain Name and Un Universal Acceptance Program uh, at ICANN. Um, and uh, um, I'll um, request Champika to briefly introduce himself as well before we start. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly and also uh, uh, see me. And um, yeah, as Samad said, uh, I'm also actually uh, from ICANN. Uh, I am from the uh, office of the CTO team. And uh, so look forward to this training today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Champika. So um, let's uh, get uh, started on um, uh, universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses. Uh, we are going to be providing a technical overview. Uh, and uh, uh, this basically focuses on uh, after introducing universal acceptance uh, on some of the challenges in um, technology as well as uh, universal acceptance is concerned. This includes uh, uh, programming challenges as well as standard challenges with uh, supporting uh, internationalized email addresses through uh, email systems. And uh, I'll take you through the first part of the presentation and then hand it over to Champika, who will talk more uh, about the email uh, address internationalization. Uh, so let's uh, get uh, started. Um, 
So universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses basically means that uh, all domain names and email addresses should work in all software applications. That's uh, the goal, of course, but uh, that's not uh, uh, how it uh, currently works. Uh, and we'll show you some data which shows that there are significant gaps in how applications actually currently support uh, the different kinds of email addresses and domain names. Um, of course, the goal, uh, if we can achieve the goal, it helps us promote consumer choice uh, because then consumers can uh, use any kinds of domain names and email addresses, not just the ones which are currently supported. It also improves competition and then provides better, broader access to end users. Um, broader because, uh, as we will see, one of the challenges in, with universal acceptance is more focused on uh, 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 internationalized domain names or domain names and email addresses in local languages. And that, uh, uh, of course, limits the accessibility of uh, the domain name systems and emails. Um, so if we are able to support all the different languages in domain names and email addresses, that does provide a much broader access uh, uh, globally. So when we uh, are talking about universal acceptance, and this is something you may have seen before in case you attended one of the earlier seminars, um, we normally categorize the domain names and email addresses in different uh, uh, types of, uh, uh, or different types or different categories. Um, Basically, if you look at the domain names, uh, the domain names more traditionally has been limited to uh, using top level domains or the last part of the domain name was always either a two letter country code uh, or uh, um, the other uh, basically uh, options were the generic top level domains like .com or .org. Uh, etc. Uh, uh, there are about 22 of those uh, labels uh, which are, which have been around for some time, um, and therefore, uh, in in many cases, many applications, they would uh, you know just to make sure uh, when while they're validating domain names, they would hard code these uh, domain names uh, into their applications. So if any application would get such applications would get domain names which are not uh, one of those uh, two letter country codes or the earlier uh, .com, .org, .net, etc. Et generic top level domains, they would consider that uh, these as invalid. However, since 2009, it is now possible to have uh, many more uh, top level domains in local languages for countries and since 2012, also possible to have these domain names, um, generic domain names in uh, uh, in different languages, even in ASCII or English. Uh, and uh, um, you know, some examples are here on the screen. You have .sky, but if you have an application which is only looking at uh, uh, you know and validating the earlier top level domains like .com and .org, they would think that Sky is not valid and therefore say that this is an invalid uh, domain name, even though it is now valid because .sky is a new GTLD. Um, some of the other ways, uh, some websites or some applications would uh, check for domain names is that they will look at the last uh, top level domain and say that, you know, it should not be more than three or four or five letters long because that's sort of the length of the earlier domain, top level domains. But now the current top level domains can be actually much longer like dot engineering or dot international. And so they would uh, consider such domain names as invalid even though they are valid. And um, the third example is the domain name in a local language like Thai in this case, but it can be any local language and script. Um, so um, such domain names are also not very widely supported by technology currently. And then all these different kinds of domain um, uh, names can be used with uh, 
in email addresses and uh, the new standards for email addresses also allow that uh, the mailbox name or the local part which is before that sign can actually also be in local language uh, so the entire email address can then be in local language as well and uh, uh, many of the uh, systems uh, do not recognize them as valid uh, but if you want to actually be universally accepting all these domain names and email addresses you should be able to uh, uh, accept uh, such domain names and email addresses, validate them properly, all the different kinds of domain names and email addresses, process them, store them, and display them. And that's really what uh, universal acceptance is uh, all about. Um, so, um, you know, how big is this problem? Uh, what we've done is actually done a series of studies um, and uh, one of the study we did was uh, look at uh, uh, websites uh, uh, globally, top 1000 websites globally. Um, and uh, what we did was we went to their contact us page and used one of the different types of email addresses which we have and type that email address in the contact us page and to see whether that website would actually accept that email address. Uh, so it was just a uh, checking the first of the five uh, actions, just accepting email addresses, not even validating or processing. Um, and um, uh, even though uh, we found that uh, almost 98% of the websites do accept new short uh, top level domains like .sky as part of the email addresses, uh, the dot .long, the uh, long ones like .international or .engineering only about 85% of the websites consider them as valid, uh, uh, you know, domain names uh, as part of the email address. And 15% of the websites actually reject them as invalid, even though they are valid. So that is a problem even in English domain names or ASCII domain names. Uh, but when we go to other languages like uh, Arabic or Chinese, the problem becomes even more severe uh, where uh, uh, if the entire email address is in Chinese or Arabic, we find that uh, only about 11% of the websites actually accept them as valid email addresses, uh, even though they are actually valid and functional email addresses. And about, uh, you know, almost 89% of the email websites just reject them as invalid. And that's obviously a very problematic, especially for those communities which are using such these scripts and languages and these domain names and email addresses. Um, so that's on the application side. We also looked at the email server side and uh, you know, found out uh, what we did was we looked at uh, the different uh, mail servers. There's actually a study where we sampled uh, some of the MX, uh, mail servers uh, through MX records uh, available to us through zone files. And uh, uh, we just uh, checked uh, whether uh, we would ping these mail servers to find out whether they support uh, um, internationalized email addresses and Shampika will later talk about uh, how how we can ping this so how we how the study is actually done um, but uh, um, you know uh, once uh, we got a response from those mail servers we could check whether they support into uh, email addresses in Unicode or not, in local languages or not. And we found that only about 9.7% of them really supported uh, only the basic function, which was just to uh, uh, respond uh, with the, what is called an SMTP UTF-8 flag, which tells us that uh, the uh, mail server is uh, potentially possibly configured to accept uh, email addresses in local languages. So 90% of the mail servers out there uh, do, would actually just reject such email addresses and bounce back those emails if they're being received from an email address in Chinese or Arabic or in Russian or any of the local languages uh, globally beyond uh, ASCII, uh, which is limited to English, for example. Uh, and that's a huge problem, right? Uh, so that's something which we obviously would also like to fix as part of universal acceptance. 
So uh, when we start uh, digging into uh, what the problem is and where the problem is, uh, what we find is that uh, the problem actually can lie at any of the layers. Uh, sometimes there is insufficient support in the operating systems uh, where there is support in operating systems. Sometimes the programming languages uh, do not support uh, some of the functions uh, and even where programming languages do support some functions, some of the applications which use these programming languages are not just designed properly to address uh, all the domain names and email addresses. So the problem actually could lie at any of the layers. And so one would obviously need to um, figure out which layer is problematic and eventually, of course, fix it. Uh, similarly, on the email ecosystem side, um, um, you know, when we talk about an email server, uh, we're really not talking about a single system, but actually a combination of multiple systems, which includes uh, user agents, submission agents, transfer agents, uh, um, and uh, delivery agents, as well as, uh, uh, you know, um, for example, spam filters and others. Uh, so the whole ecosystem. Uh, which consists of all these components uh, independently need to be UA ready or be able to handle internationalized email addresses for the entire chain to work properly. And even if some single component doesn't work, of, of course, your email would bounce back. Um, and uh, again, uh, we will talk about uh, email systems in more detail during our session today as well. Um, so that sort of uh, gives uh, an overview of uh, what universal acceptance problem is. Uh, and uh, uh, let actually, let me stop here to see if you have any questions at this time before we get into a little more technical details of uh, how we, uh, uh, you know, what is the relevant technology behind this and uh, how we start uh, fixing these things. Uh, yes, please, Gopal, please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much for a good start here. Uh, do plugins improve acceptability? Email packages, plugins can be written. And how does the acceptability change? Maybe you have used only the default email packages that are readily available. If we write yeah. plugins, what will happen? So um, I guess um, uh, plugins, uh, one obviously could write uh, plugins to uh, update the systems uh, or uh, the, and uh, they could be, uh, the challenge with plugins is that they're not uh, widely available. They're only available to, I guess, the person who's developing the plugin, unless, uh, unless that plugin can be fed back into the actual, uh, uh, system uh, and adopted by the system and then it can be more widely uh, I guess disseminated through the next uh, version of that system so so plugins can certainly be uh, developed to fix or patch a system which doesn't work uh, but uh, that's a, a very localized solution and perhaps a shorter term solution uh, but it's and also not a very interoperable system, right? Uh, the most, uh, I guess, robust or interoperable solution would be to eventually uh, feed that uh, patch back into the main system and uh, get it integrated into the next version of the system so that uh, it can get transmitted and disseminated uh, across the board. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, Looking forward to the next step. You asked for questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So, any other questions? Otherwise, we move forward. All right. So, um, so when we, um, you know, a, a big part of uh, uh, this universal acceptance is. Uh, uh, having uh, supporting domain names and email addresses in local languages, uh, in addition to, of course, uh, longer and newer ASCII strings. Um, 
So um, the way uh, domain names and email addresses are encoded and eventually supported in local languages is by using the base uh, Unicode standard. So, so the internationalized domain names and internationalized email addresses uh, use Unicode as their underlying standard. Uh, and therefore it is uh, useful to understand a little, a few details about Unicode uh, to really understand how, uh, of course, the domain names and email addresses in Unicode work. Um, Unicode um, is an encoding uh, which, uh, which actually uh, includes the glyphs um, or uses glyphs of different scripts and maps them onto code points uh, to encode the different languages of the world or different scripts of the world. And uh, um, basically it's a script-based standard, uh, not a language-based standard. Um, and uh, it actually encodes uh, code points uh, uh, in in a you know in one way it represents code points is in a hex format which is written as u plus uh, you know four hexadecimal uh, numbers or uh, digits um, and you know we actually have an, a couple of examples here um, so you can actually have u u plus zero zero six five which uh, uh, represents a uh, letter E, uh, which is also equivalent to ASCII, which is another encoding, uh, which is uh, limited to uh, normally just the, uh, you know, what is used to write English. Um, and it also has uh, ASCII value of E, has an ASCII value of E, and also Unicode value of U plus 0065. Uh, normally, uh, Unicode files are stored in uh, different formats. One of the more popular formats is what is called UTF-8 format. Uh, it is a variable number of byte format, meaning that, uh, you know, letter E will be stored in um, perhaps uh, uh, one byte, but uh, there may be other letters which may require two bytes to store. And there could be other letters which could require three bytes to store. So you can't really say that one byte stores one character, it really depending on uh, the kind of uh, character you're storing, it may actually take a variable number of bytes. Uh, and there, but of course, if you have UTF file, file format readers, uh, they can decode that information for you and you don't need to worry about it. Uh, but you can't read it byte at a time. I guess that's uh, uh, to encode uh, or to understand characters. And that's, I think, one of the underlying things to understand. Um, so um, the way Unicode works is that it actually uh, has a different unique number for any different glyph or letter in any script of the world. And, and so it can simultaneously uh, encode all the different scripts and languages, uh, so basically uh, glyphs in all the different scripts of the, uh, of the various, uh, you know, globally used scripts. Um, it also allows uh, to encode different kinds of uh, glyphs. Uh, there are, for example, uh, characters which are complex, uh, meaning that they are actually a base character, but also have additional diacritics or marks above or below or uh, around them. And uh, in some cases, uh, the way Unicode is encoded, it allows that a single character can actually be represented in multiple ways. Um, there is an example in front of you where uh, you could actually have a single Unicode code point 00E8 to represent E with an accent, this particular accent. Um, but uh, there is also um, E, simple E, and the accent itself separately encoded in Unicode. So you could actually formulate E with an accent by actually combining those two code points as well. So there are two different ways, for example, in this case, where the same character can be encoded um, by two different Unicode sequences, either by 00E8 or by 0065 followed by 0300. And that's a bit problematic because uh, uh, then you could actually have a two different technical representations of the same character. And that creates uh, some level of ambiguity. 
Uh, and to address that ambiguity, uh, basically uh, Unicode itself presents a solution um, by presenting multiple normalization forms, um, where uh, it basically says that uh, in uh, uh, where to where there are two different ways of uh, or more than one way of representing a particular uh, glyph. Uh, if you normalize it, uh, it would take all the different forms and map them onto a single form. Uh, and that provides you a unique solution, which is unambiguous. Um, no, there are, multi as I said, multiple normalization forms, but uh, the normalization forms used in domain names or internationalized domain names is normalization form C. Uh, and what that does is uh, generally uh, take any input and maps it onto generally the composed form, though there are some exceptions. So it will take the either 00 E8 and, and normalization form C converter would just convert 00 E8 into 00 E8. So there's no change. But if you feed it 0065 followed by 0300 and send that to a normalization form C converter, it will actually output you the map or map it back onto 00 E8. So if you give it either of the two forms as input, it will you will always get 00 E8 the as a unique form as the output. And what that does is that it actually, uh, so if you take any string or input in norm, uh, and take it through normalization form C, it will remove the ambiguity and give you only a unique string which you can then compare and uh, utilize in your technical standard. Uh, so internationalized domain names, the way they are formed, um, require that every string input string has to be in normalization form C. Uh, for it to be used as domain names uh, to obviously address this ambiguity. All right, so let's keep moving on. Um, so that's sort of the basic uh, percept of uh, Unicode. The Unicode is then used to form strings uh, and those strings then eventually are used to form domain names. Um, as far as internationalized domain names are concerned, um, you know, a dom basically a domain name, if you look at it, is normally formed by multiple labels. Um, you know, at the top of the screen, you'll see an example. You know, you can have www.example.co.uk. That's a domain name. It is actually, uh, the way it's interpreted is it's actually a series of labels which are separated by dots. So the rightmost label .uk in this case is normally referred to as the top level domain. Um, .co is called the second level domain, example is the third level domain, and www is the fourth level domain, and so on. So uh, basically, um, as far as the top level domains is concerned, initially, as we discussed, the top level domains were normally two to three characters long. Um, two characters are always country codes like .ca for Canada. And then three characters, we had some initial ones like .com, .org, .net, .edu, and I guess we are familiar with them. But now it is possible to have longer uh, strings uh, or domain names uh, like .info, .google, .engineering, as we just saw earlier as well. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, these top level domain, they're not a fixed uh, set. Uh, there are always new top level domain names which can be added into the root zone of the internet or they can be removed as well. So since they change over time, it is not a good idea to use a fixed list of these top level domains whenever you're doing your programming, but always uh, dynamically check uh, whatever, whatever is the latest uh, list of uh, domain names from, from the root zone, and that is available through the link here, uh, which, uh, so once you get the presentation, you can actually use that link to go to the root zone of internet and check the latest list of domain names, which is uh, available at any time. Domain names can also be internationalized as we just talked about, uh, you know, we can, the, the example we just saw, example.co.uk is an ASCII-based domain name. 
but now we can have unicode based domain names um, in latin script chinese script or any other script of the world and that is actually defined by what is called the idna 2008 standard uh, internationalized domain name in applications uh, 2000 there are two versions the earlier version was 2003 uh, but that version is no longer valid uh, there was a new version which was developed in 2008 and that is the applicable uh, version uh, and when you're actually doing programming uh, you have to be careful because uh, sometimes there are some libraries which you use in programming which say that they are uh, idn compliant that they support idn but uh, they are older libraries and they actually are compatible only with idna 2003 the early version and they do not really support the idna 2008 version so when you're using programming libraries or tools uh, and uh, you should verify that they actually indeed support the latest uh, IDNA 2008 version and not the early version IDNA 2003. All right, um, so let's uh, keep moving on. Um, Gopal, I see your hand up. Uh, if it's a, is it a new hand or old hand? Uh, if it's a new question. Uh, old hand, I'm removed. Sorry. My no problem. No problem. Um, so um, when we talk about uh, uh, domain names, um, there are two equivalent forms of domain names. Uh, one is called the U-label, which is the Unicode form of the label. And then the second is the A-label, which is the uh, ASCII form of the label. Though these two forms are equivalent to each other, uh, a label is the back end form or underlying form, which is really used by the machines, not intended for humans. Um, and uh, basically, the Unicode label, uh, U label, which is the, the Unicode form uh, in local languages and scripts, uh, that's really intended for end users. So, the way things are set up is that uh, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between a U-label and an A-label. So each U-label creates a unique A-label and uh, vice versa. Uh, and uh, A-label forms are used by machines, which are more tuned to um, processing ASCII. Uh, but when it is displayed to end users, it's converted to a readable format in U-label. So um, human users would uh, see uh, you know, strings or labels like example with you know, A with a carrot sign there. Um, uh, but uh, when it goes uh, into the applications on the wire, what happens is uh, this is converted into ASCII or mapped down to ASCII uh, using an internal algorithm, which is defined in RFC 3492. It's called a... Uh, um, it's called Punicode. Um, so what happens is that the application will take the Unicode input, uh, map it into a Punicode using RFC 3492 algorithm, actually, and you don't need to worry about that algorithm as well. There are actually two ASCII and two Unicode uh, uh, functions which are available in most programming languages. So you can actually just call those functions to do conversions between these two formats. Um, so, uh, but... Uh, when you map anything to ASCII, it is all it is not really clear uh, for a machine that whether that is really an ASCII or an underlying uh, uh, it, you know underlying is it just an ASCII label or is it really an inter internationalized domain name label label which has been mapped onto ASCII. So to make that distinction, uh, with the standard IDNA two thousand and eight uh, basically says that anything which is supposed to be interpreted as a internationalized domain name uh, would what we would do is we would append xn dash dash in front of the pinu code which is actually generated so if you look at the example here uh, with a a with a carrot what that does is the first step is that the example string is uh, mapped onto a pinu code using rfc 3492 algorithm and that creates exmple hyphen xta that's sort of the output of that algorithm 
which is what we call puny code. But to represent that um, uh, puny code as an internationalized domain name label, xn dash dash is prefixed onto it. So what you get is xn dash dash exmple hyphen xda, and that really represents uh, to a machine that is interpreted as that this is actually x and dash dash means that it is an internationalized domain name and then um, the punicode part of it actually tells the actual unicode string which uh, uh, it represents um, and uh, of course uh, the same can be done on any of the labels so uh, the second example is from chinese which creates a punicode and then you add x and dash dash to create the corresponding id and label um okay so um so that's how um domain names work so again please remember that domain name has two forms human readable form which we call the u label which is the chinese version for example on the left here and then the a label is the underlying equivalent ascii form which is on the right hand side the xn dash dash and then followed by dash dash f38 the random ascii sequence so ascii sequence on the right is really what is processed by the machines but when it is displayed in the browsers or in on the, to the end users through applications it gets converted back into the chinese label uh, and that's what you would see um, so so both forms actually exist so email uh, similarly for email addresses uh, we can actually uh, normally email address has the syntax mailbox name at domain name where mailbox name is the local part also called the local part and domain name is the domain name part of course um, we've seen that domain names can actually be now in ascii as well as uh, unicode uh, mailbox names in the most recent standards also allow uh, mail uh, to allow mail, you know these to be represented in addition to ASCII, which we are more used to seeing also in uh, UTF-8 format. Um, so for example, we can have a domain name totally in Chinese with the mailbox name or local part in Chinese, as well as uh, the domain name part uh, in Chinese uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a couple of examples here with Kevin uh, at example.org where Kevin actually E has an accent there, therefore it's not a ASCII label or mailbox name, it's actually a non-ASCII and therefore um, it is also an internationalized domain email address. So anything which has a no, UTF-8 format for the mailbox name, uh, whether it has ASCII domain name or uh, IDN domain name doesn't matter as long as what is before that sign is not ASCII, but uh, represented in Unicode in UTF-8 format, uh, that email address actually is normally referred to as the internationalized email address. So we've uh, now know what uh, domain names look like. So there are two forms, um, they can be in multiple languages and similarly email boxes uh, or email addresses can also be in local languages. So then, um, you know, the issue is that some applications are still verifying domain names incorrectly by using one of the methods. Uh, this is something we talked about earlier, and uh, obviously we're uh, repeating that here. So if you're checking uh, a top level domain on a fixed length, like uh, saying that the top level domain in a domain name label can be between two to four characters, that is going to make your application uh, not UA compliant because as we just saw the top level domain names can be much longer um, they can like even in ascii they could be dot uh, uh, international or dot engineering which is much longer than four characters or if you look at this chinese uh, email uh, a top level domain so if this was a top level domain um, the equivalent uh, uh, chinese uh, a label would be this xn dash 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 f38 am and so on it's much longer than two to four characters right um so by standards tlds can be up to 63 characters so if you're really developing an application and you really want to 
check for a top level domain based on length you have to say that it can be between um, 2 to 63 uh, ascii characters long um, also um, you know one of the other problems which uh, some of the websites have is that in, you know they're not checking on length but they're actually checking on fixed list of tlds so they're uh, either checking on the country codes or um, you know they're checking on the more more conventional top level domains like .com or .org uh, or even if you're doing uh, you know something with new top level domains like .international or so on you go to the root zone database and you actually get the latest list and you hard code that list or make a static list to check in your application even that will not work because uh, you know what the top level domain list is today is not going to you know that may change tomorrow where you may get some extra root uh, labels in the root zone tomorrow or some root zone labels uh, which are there today may be dropped tomorrow so using static lists is not going to work and then of course if you're just checking for ascii characters and you're not really checking for chinese or russian uh, for domain names, you know, that's just not going to work for internationalized domain names. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, Call the guy from Nakulabi. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Um, um, and then uh, similarly, um, uh, we um, also get a similar issue, not only with domain names, but also with internationalized email addresses. So if your application is uh, checking for email addresses and it is uh, only checking for ASCII email addresses, then of course we have a problem because it will not be able to process uh, email addresses in your local language, uh, you know, wherever you're coming from. And it is possible to have those email addresses in local languages. So you really, if you're really designing a universally acceptable accepting application, you should make sure that the mailbox uh, is checking for UTF-8 format characters uh, and not really just ASCII characters. And domain name part can be just uh, can be ASCII or internationalized domain name. So you have to make sure that your applications are flexible. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, to make sure that your applications do work, uh, you would need to have some test cases and test data. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've actually developed a couple of documents to provide you that information. Um, so, um, even though you can actually have specific information, uh, specific applications, but uh, in general, um, you know, even if you have very specific information, they have an, uh, uh, generally an interface which accepts uh, input and validates input and then processes input at the back and stores input in the database and eventually processes and displays output. Um, so, so what we've actually done in this document USG026 is uh, uh, develop this framework and given provided test cases uh, acceptance test, validate test, uh, uh, which you can do uh, on any of your applications to see whether your applications are UA ready or not. For those test cases, you need to have uh, uh, domain names and email addresses in local languages for them to test. And uh, for that purpose, we actually have USG004, uh, which actually provides you with the sample or example uh, domain names and uh, email addresses. These are all functional email addresses and domain names uh, in all the different scripts and languages which we support. So, um, so with uh, test uh, cases in USG026 and a document and uh, test data in 004, uh, it, uh, together they provide you with uh, uh, relevant tools which you can use to eventually test your applications to see whether they are uh, universally accepted, uh, you know, UA ready or not. Uh, let's see, we'll take a quick pause here, see if you have any questions, comments yet. All right. Um, so, 
uh, then then let's keep moving on. Um, so um, when you're validating user input, uh, basically one of the things you should uh, um, uh, do is, uh, you know, normally the validation is done for domain names and email addresses is done at two levels. There's a, uh, can be validation uh, on at syntax level where you check that you know it is well formed it has email address as an at sign domain name has dots in the middle and then you can do functional checks meaning that uh, the domain name actually uh, resolves and uh, actually returns or email address actually uh, can uh, does work and uh, you know can receive emails and uh, send emails um, and uh, when you are validating, you need to make sure um, um, that, uh, you know, when you're using syntax checks, uh, do not use overly complex syntax checks. Keep your syntax checks very simple and try to make sure that you, you know, do actual validation using your functional checks, meaning that uh, the top level domain works and email address works. Uh, rather than trying to make very complex uh, uh, structures on syntax to see, you know, what is a valid email address and what is a valid domain name. Um, so there are different checks you could do. Um, uh, normally, uh, domain name labels can contain letters, digits, and hyphens, uh, but that's only for ASCII. If, if you go to Unicode labels, then it gets uh, much more complex. Uh, as far as the length is concerned, each label uh, in a domain name, which is separate by a dot, can no longer be 63 ASCII characters uh, or octets, and the total length can be uh, no more than 255 octets. In IDNA 2003, uh, it, uh, you know, your, each label should be a valid A label or a valid U label. Um, and then you can actually, uh, so those are the kind of checks you could potentially do. Uh, you can check for valid A labels or valid U labels using different libraries. Uh, maybe you can do a maximum length uh, check on things. Um, but uh, I think doing just an ASCII based check is probably not going to be sufficient because uh, ASCII, of course, is not the only way domain names can be represented. Um, as far as uh, validating function, so the best way would be to do a validating function check, which is uh, you can make a DNS request and see whether the domain name works or not. Uh, and then after, of course, you've validated, you can actually use the domain name and uh, uh, you know start using it. Um, also, um, um, basically for email addresses, uh, Domain name part should be validated as we've already discussed and the mailbox, uh, you should make sure that uh, it is either ASCII or UTF-8, but you should allow for both and make sure that it is not just limited to ASCII verification. Um, but, um, you know, beyond just uh, checking that something's UTF-8 uh, or ASCII at uh, domain name, um, if you want to do more stringent checking, that's probably not a good idea. Um, best way is to just uh, check it functionally by sending and receiving emails to that particular address. Um, and then once you verified that the address works, then you can obviously use that address as either a user ID in your applications or to send and receive emails. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, here's an example of uh, what some of um, websites or applications try to do, and this is obviously not recommended. So uh, even though in this particular case, this is rec the recommended solution for OWASP, which is a, you know, a security related uh, organization and gives you secure solutions. But uh, in this case, the solution they're providing you is insufficient and incorrect actually, because it only validates perhaps uh, ASCII based uh, email addresses and what, uh, it should be doing is allowing you to do all uh, ASCII as well as Unicode based email addresses. So, you know, you can see that it is allowing uh, mailbox to be limited to ASCII letters and digits and some symbols, but does not allow UTF-8 uh, uh, Unicode characters in um, the mailbox part. Uh, it is also limiting TLDs to 
length between two and seven, uh, even though we know that they can be as as long as sixty three characters. Uh, and uh, top level domains are limited to uh, just letters A through Z and capital A through Z, but does not allow, for example, internationalized uh, domain names, top level domains. So even though uh, that this seems like a reasonable choice from security point of view, but uh, actually it is now an outdated uh, um, recommendation. And if you really want to use uh, the correct uh, domain names and email addresses now, this would just not work. Um, so in, you know, we've already talked about USD 004. Uh, it has a list of email addresses. If you want to check your own email server, whether it is working or not, just go to this document. I will share the link. Uh, through the presentation uh, and you can just send an email to from your email address to any of these email addresses and they configure to respond back so you get an auto response back and if you don't get an auto response back it means that uh, your email address is not configured to support or your mail server is not configured to support internationalized email addresses uh, we've also looked at different programming languages and their libraries to see which mail and IDN related utilities are supporting email uh, universal acceptance. There are many in green which do support uh, universal acceptance well, both uh, for different, you know, for all the different kinds of programming languages. Um, they support IDN. In the last column, it tells you whether it is related to IDN or email. Uh, that particular uh, library. And um, so when you're choosing libraries in a pro particular programming language, make sure that you choose ones which do support the um, universal acceptance and do not use the ones which do not support universal acceptance. So in summary, uh, be aware that UA identifiers may not be fully supported in software and libraries. Use the right libraries and frameworks adapt your code to properly support GUA and do unit and system testing uh, using UA test cases uh, and test data to ensure that your software is UA ready. And that brings me to the end of this first section. Let's see if you have any questions before I hand it over to Champika for talking about email address internationalization. If not, then um, thank you. And um, um, Champika, it's over to you to take us through email address internationalization. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Samad. Uh, shall I uh, share the slides or, or you're going to drive it? Totally up to you. If you want to share the slides, I can okay, stop Okay, I will try to share the slides so then uh, I can then go based on the place. Um, are you a co-host? Uh, yeah, do you, um, do you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Okay. You can see yeah, the slides. You'll right? have to, you can, you'll have to reshare in the presentation mode. Oh, you're not seeing the presentation mode? Nope. Okay. Uh, hold on. We can see the presentation. Okay. Uh, let me try again. How about now? Yeah, we're still seeing the regular mode, not the presentation mode. Same? Yeah. OK, maybe then you can uh, share some up. All right, so let me share. OK, 
Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, and and uh, you can possibly uh, move your mouse pointer when I speak to the point, then that would be much clearer. Uh, all right, everyone. Uh, so uh, in the uh, earlier section, uh, Sarma went through uh, in detail about uh, the universal acceptance. And then uh, he also spoke about the uh, internationalized domain names uh, and also um, introduced uh, the email address uh, uh, internationalization part as well. And in this section, I will go in detail into the uh, configuration or, or uh, the setup uh, aspects of uh, email address internationalization. So uh, obviously the uh, the term is quite long, uh, email address internationalization. Uh, so instead of this whole uh, long uh, thing, we will call it as EAI. So in the uh, coming slides, when I always refer to EAI, uh, that stands for email address internationalization. Now we will need to look into uh, what is really EAI and what is not really EAI. So as you can see in the slide, um, also Sama did mention about this point as well earlier, uh, when you see a mailbox name uh, or the domain name, uh, which is uh, uh, the mailbox name is before that sign and then, then the domain is after that sign, uh, we, you know, if there are UTF support or basically you know, uh, there are glyphs involved uh, other than ASCII, then uh, we will call it as EAI. Uh, but uh, say so far, even if the email ID is not um, EAI, say even if you have an ASCII email, it is still possible nowadays, you might still see uh, different you know, uh, scripts in your subject line uh, or in the address commands or in the message body you know, those things do not really fall into the EAI category. So we don't call those as EAI. Now, if your email ID is just ASCII, but if you have some uh, in the email body, if you have some uh, other glyphs or other, you know, local language scripts, uh, that would not really fall into the uh, EAI because, you know, those things um, can still be handled by the conventional email. Like there are, there are provisioning uh, in terms of, uh, things like MIME, for example, it can handle these sort of attachments and so on. Uh, so that do not really fall into the EAI. So we just need to uh, uh, have this uh, uh, proper, uh, you know, separation between what is EAI and what is not EAI. Uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. Now, uh, so now we know what is EAI and, and what is not EAI. Uh, so now in terms of the uh, implementation, there are few levels. Uh, you can see this in the slide. Now in, in uh, these uh, levels, uh, first thing is of course, there is no AI support, which means only the ASCII email addresses are supported. Uh, so if you consider, if you are using a particular email uh, software, uh, if uh, that can only support uh, ASCII emails, uh, we call it, there is no EAI support, right? Uh, so this can, be, uh, this can be applicable to any of these tools or services. Now, the other option is, uh, we call it as level one support. So in the level one support, um, we can uh, exchange emails with the EAI addresses, uh, but this is only Kind of restricted to receiving emails and sending emails. Say, for example, I have an EAI email uh, ID. If I can send an email using my local language email ID, uh, if I can send an email using that, uh, yeah, that is, uh, that is applicable to this level. And also, uh, if I can receive from someone else uh, who send it from a um, a UTF-8 based email ID or EAI email ID, uh, then we uh, also actually have this uh, into the same level one. But if there is no provisioning for creating mailboxes, say uh, if I cannot create a mailbox uh, using UTF-8 uh, 
or, or different uh, local language scripts you know that's uh, that's uh, that's another uh, 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 aspect in the level one so if you consider level one in level one we can only send and receive emails but not really create any uh, email boxes or uh, mailboxes okay but in level two we can do all that means I can send emails, I can receive emails from email, EI addresses, and then I can also actually create mailboxes uh, and, and domain names in UTFA. So these are the three levels that we will need to um, you know, understand here. Uh, and then there are some references uh, with different other tools, uh, which tool can support what level. So these are you know just to uh, make sure that you understand and these different levels so if you if you pick a certain uh, email software or email tool where you can create mailboxes and then you can send emails you can receive emails you can do everything basically right so this is what we call level two support okay next slide all right so let's try to understand how uh, you know when we send an email uh, you know, what's the process of uh, delivering this email? Now, if you're going to send this email to uh, say use at example.com as uh, shown in the slide. Uh, so our domain here is example.com, right? So um, now, first of all, we have to find that if we are to send this email, now that's the particular domain. And then we will need to understand what are the mail servers associated with this domain? So how do we find that? In DNS, we have a record type called MX records. Uh, MX stands for mail exchanges. So in DNS, we have to define uh, what are the mail servers uh, that would handle emails uh, for this particular domain, which is example.com. Uh, so as you can see in this example, uh, there are three MX records listed in the DNS. So whoever managing example.com zone, they have to list these MX records in the zone file. So those are the MX records, uh, as you can see in the mouse pointer, right? So the, there are three MX records. So now uh, MX records also has uh, in the uh, R data field, that is actually the resource data, which is right side to the MX record. Uh, you can see there is a, a number over there. So uh, the first two um, lines say it's, uh, it's 10, and then the uh, other one says it's 20. So this is what we call priority, because when you define mail service, you can actually uh, define a certain priority. So the lower the number means higher the priority. So actually um, the uh, 10 has got a better priority than the uh, 20. So basically server, th server one and two has got more priority than the server three. So when the emails are being sent to this particular domain, example.com, uh, uh, it would try to send uh, first to server one or server two, right? And then uh, if one of those servers fail uh, or if, if, if it can't reach to server one and server two, then it would then try out the server three because it has got less uh, lesser priority, okay? So that's the, uh, uh, you know, this is actually from DNS point of view. I mean, this is common whether you have any uh, ASCII email ID or, or UTF-8 based, you know, EAI email ID because DNS, uh, this is something uh, related to the DNS, okay? Next slide, please. All right, so when the email uh, is delivered uh, in terms of the delivery path, uh, here you can see that um, earlier, you know, Sarmat also mentioned about different components in an email uh, system. We have mail use agents, then we have mail transfer agents uh, and, and so on, right? Uh, so in, in this example, you can see that um, the first uh, uh, graphic shows that the uh, both sender and receiver, they have some mail clients. And uh, today we have uh, quite a lot of mail clients, email clients, right? And then uh, also, as you can see in the second uh, graphic, 
some of these male clients, they can also be uh, web-based, uh, you know, web-based clients as well, web applications, basically, right? So depending on these um, email clients, sometimes, you know, different protocols also can be used. As you can see uh, in, in the first uh, case, uh, there are some protocols used uh, between the mail servers. We use SMTP, which is the uh, simple mail transfer protocol. And then uh, to deliver the mail from the, uh, to the receiver, we have different protocol called uh, POP and IMAP. So these are also, you know, different uh, other protocols. So in, in web-based cases, sometimes, you know, this may not be the case. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, just the HTTP, for example, or it could be, you know, just, a, a, you know, local uh, sort of, you know, other protocol proprietary one, I, right? So, uh, and then for uh, typical uh, mail user clients, you know, we can use our desktop, laptop, or, or mobile. Next slide. Okay, now in terms of the uh, email uh, delivery part, um, there are a few considerations here. Uh, first of all, that um, when we send an email, uh, we do not know exactly uh, what sort of uh, environment that the receiver is having, which means we don't know exactly what protocols that, the, you know, when we send an email to someone, we don't know exactly the sender is, go, you know, what sort of uh, email client that the sender is having or what sort of uh, protocols that, the, you know, they are going, they are using. You know, these kind of things we do not know. Basically, we don't know the features of, uh, of both ends, basically, right? And uh, so this is why sometimes um, when we send an email, the email uh, may not be able to send it uh, to the receiver. It could fail in the middle. And uh, so this could uh, depend on various factors. Uh, now, because this email delivery goes through several email servers, that's the thing that you need to understand, right? So there are many email servers. Sometimes it could be few, sometimes it could be more. Uh, for example, you know, when I send an email, say I'm sending an email to you, um, my, you know, the email could be going from my email client to the email servers uh, that is managed by, say, my, uh, by my mail server operator. And then it could be going to uh, another operator, right? And, and then, you know, there could be several um, mail servers that it could be passing to, and it gets to the uh, mail server that is actually storing the emails for you so that you could come and download those emails from that mail server. So we don't know. And when I send that email, I don't know any of those things, right? I can only know about my, myself, my client, and uh, I don't know exactly uh, the other end. So this is unknown at the beginning. And uh, now based on that earlier discussion that we had, I also told you that depending on uh, the domain that I'm sending, there could be multiple of the uh, multiple of mail servers involved, right? For that particular domain. In the DNS, we uh, specified the you know, number of MX records and so on. So depending on that priority, depending on the number of mail servers we have, uh, we cannot expect every time the mail to go in the same path. Because you know, in case if uh, say uh, I send you an email now and um, you get this email through a certain path, uh, but say uh, after some time, uh, say one mail server is not uh, available for some reason, maybe the link is down or something, right? So mail server is not available. And then uh, say, um, when I send an email after some time, uh, if it's going to take uh, a different other mail server, depending on the priority, uh, the path could be different. So the whole idea here is that uh, we cannot expect the same delivery path for every email that we send. So uh, that's something that we need to understand. Now, these uh, email features, you know, basically these features are only identified at one hop at a time. So if I am a mail server, when I try to send an email to my next hop, the next email server, uh, then, you know, we have to have some sort of uh, exchange or signaling uh, exchange. Then only I 
will know exactly what is my next hop can support, uh, but not through the whole delivery part. Next slide. All right, so with, with these uh, uh, concepts in mind, let us go into the, uh, the configuration part. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so in terms of these uh, email protocol changes for EAI, um, first of all, uh, we have to make sure that uh, these protocols can be supported to understand EAI. Uh, if you remember, I uh, mentioned these protocols earlier. Uh, so SMTP is the protocol that we use uh, <clears throat> between the mail transfer agents, right? Uh, so simply we call those as mail servers basically, right? So between the mail servers, we have uh, SMTP. And so we have to make sure that these uh, SM, you know, uh, SMTP is, uh, uh, SMTP uh, support is there uh, for the EAI. That is quite important. For this, there is a signaling flag. Now there is, I told you that, you know, if I'm going to say I'm a mail server, right? And I have a next hop which is another mail server. So when uh, myself and my next stop, the other mail server, you know, when we deliver, when I deliver the mail to my next hop, we have some sort of signaling. Uh, you know, we have to have uh, some sort of uh, notifications uh, between each other. So I have to um, make sure what my next hop can support. So, my next stop has to tell me that it can support EAI based email. So if I'm going to send an email to an EAI based email ID, I have to make sure that my next stop can support this. So to do that support, there is a certain signaling flag and that flag is what we call this SMTP UTF-8. So you can, as you can see in the slide, um, SMTP UTF-8, uh, that is actually the uh, exact string, the, uh, uh, the signaling flag. So I should expect this flag from my next top email server, right? Uh, so basically uh, in the whole path, whole SMTP, in the, in the whole delivery path, all these SMTP servers, they should support this SMTP UTF-8 flag. So that is something uh, very important in terms of uh, EI uh, email delivery. And then uh, for the delivery aspect, that means from the mail delivery agent to the client, because you know when the client, uh, the receiving client, when it gets the emails, um, it 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 gets the it downloads the email from the uh, mail delivery agent. So the protocol we use for uh, this is uh, something like POP or IMAP. Now we also have to make sure that. Um, the uh, uh, POP and IMAP protocols also actually make sure they can do the uh, EAI support as well. Uh, so, uh, so the key thing here is that all these protocols that we use in uh, email delivery, like SMTP, POP, IMAP, they should all uh, augmented to support uh, EAI based email IDs. Next slide. Now, this is just a sort of, you know, very quick example to uh, show this process. Uh, as you can see here, um, we have a sender, we have a receiver, um, MUA is basically the mail user agent. And then in between, you can see there are a few uh, MTAs. Uh, and then uh, uh, let's focus into uh, say between two MTAs. So S, S stands for uh, the sending uh, mail transfer agent. And then R is actually the uh, receiving mail uh, transfer agent. So there is some sort of, as I said earlier, there is some uh, communication or, or some signaling has to happen between the sender and the receiver. So those signaling are listed in the slide, as you can see, uh, but, you know, when you have S, that means the sender, uh, R means the receiver. So, you know, you can see the whole uh, signaling or, or the notifications happening between the sender and the receiver. Um, so typically when, uh, when the sender gets an acknowledgement uh, with, a, uh, with, with a code starting from two, 
uh, that means it's okay actually. So uh, everything, you know, all these notifications receiving from the receiver with a uh, code starting to, that means, you know, it can accept basically, right? So uh, if you say, for example, you know, if the receiver can accept the uh, attachments, right? If the receiver can accept the attachments, you can see that, you know, there's a code 250 um, with eight, eight bit mine. So it, it basically receive, uh, send the nodes that it can send these attachments. So in the same way, uh, important thing for uh, submitting the EAI based email is that uh, signaling flag called SMTP UTF-8. So uh, the receiver has to respond with that signaling flag. Uh, so in this, you can see that 250 uh, SMTP UTF-8 means uh, sender knows that it can send uh, this email uh, to an, uh, the to the next stop basically, right? Because this email ID is going to be uh, an EAI based email ID, and then uh, it can send it to the next top or the next uh, mail transfer agent. So that is the key thing here. So we have to make sure that the receiving mail server responds with this SMTP UTF-8 flag. And the rest of the things you can also see that um, uh, when you go to the message body, those things, uh, whatever the stuff in the message body doesn't really applicable here because I told you that uh, the subject line and, and message body and things like that, they, uh, they're they not really EAI part, but here the main thing is the email ID itself, right? Okay, next slide. Okay, um, so just to sort of summarize, we spoke about the protocol changes, we uh, spoke about the delivery path consideration. And the bottom line here is all email parties involved in the delivery path, right uh, you know everyone they have to be updated to have the EAI support that's the key message here even if there is a single SMTP server in the middle that cannot support EAI our email is not going to be delivered right so uh, so this is a challenge actually because uh, you know sometimes our email ID e sometimes our email can go through several email uh, several email servers to get to that receiver's email ID, right? So um, we have to make sure that all those servers in the middle, uh, they have to have the EAI support. That is the key. Next slide. Now what happens, uh, say, uh, as you can see in this slide, say if one of the mail servers do not have uh, EAI support in the path, Right, so you can see that um, you know the uh, in this case the uh, particular mail server which is uh, which cannot send an uh, email to the uh, next hop. So you can see there's a red cross over there uh, because uh, when that uh, receiving mail server do not respond with that SMTP UTF-8 flag, so uh, the sending mail server knows that it cannot send this email. Right, so we you know we can't send the email beyond that point. So then obviously this email will be dropped, right? Because it cannot send this email, and then uh, we you know the uh, that particular MPA has to send back uh, 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 undelivery undelivered report, right? So because you know um, basically an error error report, it cannot be sent. So this is something similar to uh, email bounce backs because you know we know that yeah, if we can't send an email to an email a particular email ID if that does not exist also uh, it sends a bounce back to the sender. So a similar kind of you know um, uh, response and error report has to be uh, sent back to the uh, sender. Next slide. There are a few uh, additional considerations that we may need to uh, look into here. Uh, one is the uh, case folding uh, aspect. So in the case of case folding, uh, you know that in ASCII emails, uh, if you write an email ID in uh, small letters or, or, or uh, uh, capital letters, uh, there's no difference, right? We can still write an email ID in uh, simple letters or capital letters. But when it comes to EAI, this is not automatically uh, supported uh, in uh, EAI-ready software. Uh, actually, 
this is not a you know major issue as such because a lot of local language scripts do not have this uh, small and and uh, uh, or, or simple and capital sort of differentiation if you take uh, quite a lot of uh, different scripts they only have that particular script you don't have uh, small letters or big letters right so it's not a really a big uh, big issue as such um, now when it comes to the spam we still have to look into those usual uh, spam filtering software that normally you know that we deal with and also uh, so i mean i'm talking about the mechanisms things like spf or, or dkim dmark and so on uh, these are you know some of these uh, mechanisms that we use and we we still have to use those uh, methods even in AI emails. But something to be uh, aware is that uh, still some of the spam software, spam filtering softwares, they may still filter the uh, emails based on, because you know the email still might consider some local language characters, glyphs in your email ID uh, or even in the email body. So these emails might be still be filtered by the spam filters. So this is still a possibility. And uh, so this is why, uh, especially if there are some developers here who are uh, developing spam filters and so on, uh, do pay attention to this as well, uh, because uh, spam filtering software should also actually, uh, it should make sure that uh, it should not just uh, filter the software because the email ID is uh, EI. Uh, so basically uh, bottom line is that, you know, not every software or client would automatically support EAI stuff. So uh, we need to be aware of that. Next slide. Now, this is just a, a summary of uh, different email tools and services, actually. Now, uh, if you go, if you visit the uh, Universal Acceptance Steering Group website, usg.tech, uh, there is a um, uh, paper, there's a, a test results document that you can see over there, which is USG 30A. Uh, there is a link uh, to that document. Uh, if you read that, um, uh, there are some test results. So, uh, there have been some surveys conducted, some studies conducted on a number of uh, tools and services that are listed in this uh, left-hand side column. And then uh, you can also see, because some of these uh, tools, they have different functions of a, uh, a different components of an email system. Like, you know, it could they could have a component for mail user agent, or they could have a component for mail uh, storage agent, submission agent, uh, transfer agent, and so on. So uh, different of these components have been tested uh, against that particular tool. And uh, you can see what type of support that particular tool has. If you remember earlier, I was telling about uh, L1 support, L2 support and so on. Uh, so uh, you can see against a particular software, uh, which ones has got uh, what sort of support. And uh, some of course do not support, some partially uh, support as well. Uh, again, you know, uh, everything, every component is not uh, tested. Um, only the tested ones are highlighted here. But for more details, you can uh, read this uh, particular white paper and then uh, you can get a better idea of this whole uh, uh, study. Next. All right, there are a few considerations here in terms of uh, mailbox names, just to sort of quickly here. Now here, we are talking only about the mailbox part, right? Not really about the uh, domain part. Uh, it is the mailbox part. Again, uh, for this, there is, a, uh, there is a document here in the USG uh, website, USG 028. So this contains some consideration for the uh, uh, EI based mailboxes. And um, important things for us to consider here is that make sure the script that you're using, uh, it is a supported script, right? Uh, because, you know, there are so many of scripts available and, and we have to make sure that this script is, is a supporting script. And the other thing is also you have to consider whether there are any uh, security issues in terms of uh, the uh, uh, script, in, in terms of the characters that you are using. So there should not be any confusions. There should not be any security issues. So these are the key items here to think about. 
and then uh, the length of a mailbox name um, string, right? Because sometimes, you know, in, when you say in an ASCII mailbox name, uh, even in fact, in some organization, there are certain policies based on, you know, how many, how many characters that you can have in your uh, email ID or, or in your mailbox name, for example, right? Um, but we cannot take the same uh, exactly, we cannot say apply the same thing into uh, UTF-8 or e EI-based email IDs because um, there are things can vary. Um, say, for example, in terms of storage, you know, things can vary because uh, as even some explained to you earlier, uh, there are certain label sizes that we can use. There are certain uh, uh, sizes that we can use for a, a certain label or, or you, in terms of storage, when you store a single, um, uh, single glyph, right, in, in a certain local language character may not be the same number of bytes uh, applicable like in an ASCII character, right? So that is why um, we need to have some certain uh, understanding of what's, what kind of length we can have for a certain mailbox name string, and then what sort of policies that should be applied. Then uh, script mixing. So again, when if you try to mix uh, different scripts in, in a mailbox name, uh, all these things need to be uh, done very carefully because there could be some confusion, security issues can uh, arise. Again, you know, all those other issues that we dis discussed earlier uh, in terms of the particular, uh, you know, length of a string, you know, that could come into the play. So uh, just be aware if you are going to do this uh, script mixing. Next slide. And then uh, again, you know, when we pick a certain uh, mailbox name, uh, make sure that you know you avoid any different sign and symbols that are not existing in your keyboard or in, in, in any of the input devices, uh, because you know if you take a certain uh, script, you know there could be so many of uh, different symbols that can exist that you might not have in a keyboard or that you might not have in an input device. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, and then uh, also actually um, there are some tools that you can test these. So you, first of all, you should check this reference ID and tables uh, to make sure that uh, you are using a valid string, right? Uh, valid string. And then also there is a LGR tool. Um, there are links uh, to these tools from this slide as well, where you can test uh, whether this is a valid string. And then uh, always it's a, it would be a good practice to create some aliases because uh, you can have an uh, ASCII alias also, uh, because in case if the email cannot be de delivered to the EAI based email ID, then uh, at least if you have some alias, then it can be delivered to uh, the ASCII uh, email ID. So it, it is something uh, that you could do, have some aliases. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, basically, um, next thing is to uh, to see whether the readiness of the uh, software in terms of next slide, please. Anna. Next slide, uh, you can see here the EI check the tool. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, also uh, there are tools available to do this. If you go to the uhg.tech website, uh, there is a tool to check the uh, EI uh, based email IDs. You can uh, provide your uh, EI based email ID here and, and check the validity over there, right? Um, I think uh, I will uh, stop here uh, because you know this covers the EI part and then hand over to Sarmad to, uh, uh, to wind up uh, with the remaining things. Um, thank you, uh, Shampika. And um, um, so we are, I think a little over time um so because of that we'll try to close uh quickly and um um i think um you know one of the things which uh, um the underlying aim of this uh presentation is to help you make your own systems uh uh ua ready and uh, for that purpose uh, we also make some practical um case studies available. One of the case studies to, uh, 
on ICANN's own journey to make its own systems you ready. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to visit uh, USG Talk Tech website uh, and look at the case studies available. Um, and of course, the ICANN's uh, case study available as well to see you know, how maybe um, you can use this information uh, to make your own systems uh, UAD. Um, so, uh, uh, there is obviously uh, quite a bit of uh, work which is going on at ICANN to um, um, work with the larger community to make their, uh, you know, generally support UA readiness. Uh, it is, uh, ICANN is working with Universal Acceptance Steering Group, supporting Universal Acceptance Steering Group, which is a community-based initiative to, uh, you know, it does uh, gap analysis of technical applications. Uh, once the gaps are found, it actually uh, does uh, outreach and, uh, uh, bug reporting to help fix the issues and also supports uh, training and outreach activities. Um, and um, basically, you know, if uh, uh, we would also request you to become part of this process, because for uh, applications to be UA ready, we all need to make our own applications UA ready. Otherwise, uh, the ecosystem will not work. So please help us uh, raise awareness of the technical problems within your community, upgrade your own systems to be UA ready, and then based on your own experience, encourage others to make their own systems, uh, make their systems UA ready as well. And we, um, you know, the community and I can has resources available to help you uh, take uh, you through that journey. Uh, there are plenty of materials which are available online at usd.tech website. There are some examples, uh, but there are many more in case you want more information on any of the details which have been shared. Uh, you can always connect with us, us by writing to either info at usd.tech or uaprogram at ican.org uh, to get uh, more information. So please get involved. Um, we have an EAI implementers group which you could join that's run by TH Nick. Um, and uh, we also already shared the contact email addresses and website address. Uh, we also have uh, active working groups which are addressing UA problems globally. If you want to join, uh, you, know, you can just visit usc.tech website and it will, you know, you, you will have options to go and sign up for uh, USC working groups. So thank you very much. Uh, um, if you have any questions again, please feel free to connect with us uh, and uh, let me hand it back to Innocent and our organizers. Uh, to uh, Sarmat, actually, before you uh, just close, uh, there is a question um, that came. Maybe I can just uh, quickly answer that. Sure. Uh, that is uh, about the uh, fully qualified domain names, FQDNs uh, and the uh, EAI. Yeah, so when it uh, comes to uh, the email delivery, obviously we have to uh, know the domain because as I mentioned to you earlier, um, in the DNS, we have to define the uh, MX records. So all those uh, MX records uh, has to be, uh, MX records are uh, you know defined as fully qualified domains as well. And um, when it, uh, when we are speaking of uh, EAI, uh, say uh, a domain has uh, that has got the uh, UTF-8 characters, um, in you know DNS do not understand all those UTF-8 characters. In uh, in DNS uh, responses, you know it's, it's the queries and responses. It's all based on ASCII, so that is why uh, you know that uh, UTF-8 based part need to be first. Uh, uh, converted into or basically the U label has to be converted to an A label, right? So the DNS query would get resolved based on the A label. And this would be based on a fully qualified domain name. So uh, in, in from DNS point of view, uh, always uh, FQDN will come into the picture, even whether it is EI or even if it is normal email delivery. I hope that clarifies the query. Okay, Sam, over to you. Thank you, uh, Champika. And uh, 
over to you, you know, sir. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Champika and uh, Samad, uh, for your time. You've indeed shared a very resourceful content, and I'm very sure our participants have learned a lot. Uh, to those who would like to have the presentation, uh, you could kindly reach out to me. I think Sarah can share my my email. And then also just to remind you that the, our website already has that presentation. So you can alternatively uh, check on our website, which, uh, which Sarah is also going to share uh, on the chat. Uh, feel free also to get more information about our webinar series. Uh, also on the same website, uh, included our reports, of course, speakers and their profiles, uh, plus the team that made uh, the, the project a success. Uh, so allow me to recognize the presence of uh, the ICANN board chair, uh, Martin Botterman. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Glenn McKnight uh, from, the, from the nominating committee uh, we've also uh, been with uh, Bob, Bob Ocheng, who is the stakeholder engagement manager for Eastern and uh, Southern Africa at ICANN. Uh, we are very grateful to have you all on the session today. And uh, to all of you, our participants, we appreciate your commitment to this series. And uh, I believe your attendance uh, has not been uh, in vain. Yeah, I thank, um, allow me to thank our partners, uh, all our partners for the support uh, towards the success of this webinar series, uh, starting with ICANN, Mozilla, the Internet Society Uganda chapter, the Ministry of ICT in Uganda, and the National Information Technology Authority here in Uganda. Uh, lastly, I cannot forget the overwhelming efforts of the team uh, that worked towards uh, making sure that these webinar series are a success. Uh, Sarah Kiden, Lilian Achom, Esther, Akelo, Gabriela, Cliff, Joseph, and uh, Emmanuel Rook. Yeah, thank you all for your work and time. Uh, so we hope uh, that uh, this project has been uh, impactful to not only the people in Uganda, but the region and globally. Uh, and has uh, raised awareness about the need for universal acceptance for a more inclusive internet for all. Uh, all that said, allow me to adjourn the session. Uh, please do enjoy the rest of your evening, uh, afternoon or morning, depending on your time zone. So goodbye, everyone. Till next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye.